now we are going to discuss the different types of stigmas. I just told you that there are two types of stigmas which are present, the wet type and the dry type. In wet type, as already mentioned, there is a some sort of a secretion or an exudate which is present on the surface of the stigma and this is in the form of an extracellular matrix. Now these secretions are comprised of lipids, carbohydrates, triacylglycerides, etc. Epidermal cells here often have a broken cuticle. So uh, the making the penetration of the stigma by pollen tubes relatively easy and also unimpeded. Now these types of stigmas are seen in Liliaceae, Rubiaceae, Leguminosae, Orchidaceae and many others. Secretions play a vital role in the capture of pollen and adhesion. Pollen is quickly trapped by the surface tension and it gets immersed in it. The second type of stigma is the dry type of stigma and this is devoid of any exudate. But yes, there is a hydrated layer, the pellicle which is present over the cuticle. The extracellular matrix is present on dry stigmas also in case of Brassicaceae and Graminae. Penetration in dry stigma species, it, it is a, a middle, it is a little difficult because there is no exudate, the cuticle has to be actually broken. So this requires a little more effort as the pollen tubes have to secrete hydrolytic enzymes that is cutinase in this case which breaches the continuous cuticle in order to penetrate the stigma. A third type of stigma which is a very rare case seen in esterase is the intermediate type of stigma between the wet and the dry and it is called as the semi dry stigma. Now here you see that there is a picture of pollen wall which has been enlarged to show the location of this extracellular components. These extracellular components are present both in intine as well as the exine. When they are present in the intine, they are in the form of radial elongated tubules and in the case of exine, they are in the form of surface depressions. Now we have talked about the two types of uh, stigmas, there are also two types of styles which are present in the angiosperms. These are the solid style and the hollow style. Solid style is something uh, very solid, okay. So you can imagine that uh, there is a piece of chalk, it is all solid, you have to break it, okay. And on the other hand, you have a pencil. So this pencil is solid on the outside and it has a lead which is present in the center. So if I remove the lead, then that, por that uh, portion of the pencil which was occupied by the lead that is now hollow or a water hose which we use for watering our plants that that has a hollowness inside. So the water flows through that hollow pipe. So here also the styles are of two types. Uh, style is what? I hope you remember that style is the structure of a pistil which connects the stigma and the ovary by a strand of transmitting tissue with intercellular spaces and it contains extracellular components. Transmitting tissue is made up of narrow elongated cells and these are connected end to end by cell walls and also traversed by plasmodesmata. Solid style here laterally the cells are separated by intercellular spaces and these spaces are filled with pectins, proteins, carbohydrates, glycoproteins and sometimes also lipids which are secreted by the cells of the transmitting tissue itself. Now in hollow style on the contrary there is no transmitting tissue. Instead a canal is formed between the stigma and the ovary which is lined by a few layers of glandular cells. The extra component, extracellular components they fill up this canal you know and this adds uh, some kind of lubrication to the canal. The pollen tubes they glide through the stylar canal on the surface of the canal cells unlike in solid style. So what happens in solid styles is they have to go through, they have to make their way through the intercellular spaces of the transmitting tissue. Now these figures they represent uh, the upper one shows the solid style, the lower one shows the hollow style. So in the upper one you see 
that uh, if you cut a longitudinal section of this tile, you see that uh, even uh, in the middle portion there is tissue only which is present. If you compare it with the transverse section on the right, you see that uh, the pollen tubes can be seen in the intercellular spaces. Okay. Down below is the hollow style where it is like a pipe like structure which is hollow from the center. So, the pollen tubes can easily glide down and they can be seen in this canal which is formed in the style. So, this is a picture of solid and a hollow style in uh, uh, two species of trichelia. One depicts the solid style on the left hand side and a hollow style on the right hand style. This uh, trichelia, uh, both the species of trichelia, trichelia elegans and uh, ketigua, they belong to family Meliaceae. Now, I have just uh, outlined or given you some idea about the events which happen during fertilization. We just discussed that there is a quick recap that there is pollen capture on pollen addition, then pollen hydration, germination of pollen, penetration of stigma by pollen tube, then growth of the pollen tube through the stigma and the style and ultimately the entry of pollen tube into the ovule and the discharge of the sperm cells. Now, um, I would like to show you here that you can see that there are certain uh, pollen which are present on the surface of the stigma. This is in case of maize plant. After landing on a compatible stigma, the pollen grain it develops a contact with the pistil tissue and then of course it gets easily trapped in the stigmatic exudates. On dry stigma, complex interactions occur between the pollen coat substances and the cuticle pellicle layer. So, same picture. Now, mature pollen grains are metabolically inactive and desiccated at the time of anthodiacence. They have to be hydrated and this hydration occurs on the surface of the stigma. On wet stigma, of course, water, nutrients and uh, other small molecules are rapidly transported into the pollen and this is through the stigmatic exudate which is very much present on the surface of the stigma. But what happens on a dry stigma? Here the lipids they reorganize to create a capillary system between the stigma and the pollen through which water transports from the stigma to the pollen grain. Now pollen they get hydrated and then they germinate. This picture is in Nicotiana elata. Pollen germination in 3-celled pollen and in 2-celled pollen is little different. 3-celled pollen are dispersed in a more hydrated and metabolically active state as compared to species with 2-celled pollen. Once hydrated pollen grain, it transforms from a non-polar structure to a highly polarized structure which organizes into now uh, it supports a tube that is it becomes a tubular structure that is when the pollen germination comes into play. So, there is formation of filamentous cytoskeleton structures and also there is reorientation of the large vegetative nucleus, plasma membrane it deposits callos and secretory vesicles at the type uh, at the site of pollen tube emergence. The intine splits and it gives rise to the pollen tube. Penetration of the stigma by the pollen tube, pollen enzymes they play an important role and they are the ones which aid the pollen grain to penetrate the stigma, not pollen grain, it is the pollen tube now you know. Uh, so, these enzymes they facilitate the pollen tube invasion of the stigma surface. Right, So, they invade the stigma surface and uh, there is activity of enzymes like esterases, acid phosphatases, ribonucleases, proteases, proteases which has been localized to pollen intines and pollen tubes. Cutinases of course, they are present, cutinases are a type of esterases, they breach the stigma cuticle. Hydrolysis of pectin in the stigma cell wall is also very necessary for the pollen tube to enter. Now, the pollen tube it has to grow and it really grows at a very uh, fast uh, rate. 
pollen tube is the fastest growing plant cell which is known like in maize especially you know uh, it grows 2.8 uh, microns per second you know and in lily it's about 0.2 to 0.3 microns per second it is a polarized growth uh, uh, polarized growth sustaining a very high rate of elongation and it is essential for male reproductive test, uh, success. Now this process of the elongation of pollen tube this is a high ATP consuming process. Now when the pollen tube is growing there is a coordination within the pollen tubes between the cytoskeleton, the cytoplasmic organelles and the membrane vesicles bec because they deliver, uh, uh, they have to get organized into a new cell wall and uh, most uh, elongation or the most growth of the pollen tube it happens at the tip. Okay. Now here you can see there is a picture, you can see the pollen tube and the tip looks a little different from the rest. Okay. After hydration the pectic layer of intine it swells up, the thin exine on the aperture it ruptures and once it ruptures there is this pollen tube which emerges. Eventually all the contents of the pollen grain they move into the pollen tube. Okay. So, uh, the growth basically is at the tip and all the cytoplasmic content it moves to the uh, tip of the pollen tube even the further elongation of the pollen tube it takes place at the tip region because all the cytoplasm along with the nuclei everything is moved towards the tip. So to prevent the backflow of the cytoplasm at regular intervals there is formation of callous plugs. So callous plugs are a very characteristic feature of the pollen tubes. These originate from the pollen wall and then they gradually grow towards the lumen ultimately sealing the pollen tube and preventing the backflow of the cytoplasm. So you can see that we are moving moving from right to the left that is the growth of the callus. Uh, it starts from the walls and then it moves towards the center and eventually it blocks. So once it blocks the pollen tube the cytoplasm cannot move backwards. The vesicles in the pollen tube cytoplasm they contain lipids and proteins which emerge with the plasma membrane assisting in its elongation. Pollen tube cells are secretory in nature and they have extensive endoplasmic reticulum, cisternae and numerous dictyosomes. These dictyosomes they produce secretory vesicles which are mainly directed to extending the tip of the tube where they provide new plasma membrane and wall components. There is no wall at the tip of the pollen tube. There is of course plasma membrane but if there is the presence of wall it will give rigidity to the pollen tube so it is not present. The pollen tube wall of course not present at the tip but otherwise it is divided or it is a three layered structure. The outermost is the pectin layer covering the apex but not the tip. Middle pectocellulosic layer with fibrillar component and this is rich in uh, beta 1, 4 linked glucans. The inner amorphous callosic layer is rich in beta 1, 3 linked glucans. So the two different types of glucans which are present. Now this particular picture shows you the different zonation or the different zones which are present in the pollen tube. We have divided the pollen tube into four different zones. The tip is the apical zone, it is also called as the cap block, uh, cap block region. Just uh, behind the apical zone is the sub apical zone which harbors all the organelles which are present. and uh, uh, further down is the nuclear zone or the third part is the nuclear zone which uh, contains the nuclei, the vegetative nucleus and uh, the generative cell which is present and if by chance it has divided then there are sperm nuclei which are there and uh, um, 
the last zone is the vacuolated zone. So, beyond the vacuolated zone there is nothing, it is separating the rest of the, the older part of the pollen tubes by the formation of the callosic plugs. Right. Now, this is a transmission electron microscope of a pollen tube in lily. You can see that there are abundant small vesicles which are present at the apex of the tube or towards the tip of the pollen tube. Thickest cell wall is at the extreme apex which gradually thins backwards. So, these vesicles they, uh, they give extensibility to this pollen tube. Pollen tube on reaching the ovary chamber, it travels across the ovary wall or through the placenta or through the funiculus to the micropyle to gain the entry into the embryo sac. So, whatever it is, it may enter the ovule through either integuments, funiculus, calada, whatever, it is going to enter through the micropyle. And any ovular structure which guides this pollen tube into the ovule, this is called the obturator. Now, here you see there is porogamy and there is calazogamy. Porogamy is when the tube directly enters through the micropyle brassica and calazogamy is when the tube enters the ovule through the ovular tissues which are present towards the calazal region as seen in casuarina. Mesogamy is the entry of pollen tube through the funiculus you know in as seen in pistacia and sometimes it can even enter through the integuments seen in kubka bitter. But eventually or ultimately it reaches the micropyle ok. Irrespective, so I have shown you three different pathways. Irrespective of its path of entry, the pollen tube always enters through the micropyle into the ovule. It enters one of the synergids through the filiform apparatus synergid which is destined to receive the pollen tube, it starts degeneration much before the entry of the pollen tube and this synergid is called as the degenerating synergid. While the other synergid in which the pollen tube is not going to enter, it remains intact and it is called as the persistent synergid. So, here are the two synergids. In the uh, picture on the left hand, you see that both the synergids are intact and the picture on the right side shows you that one of the synergid is shriveled, it has started disintegrating whereas the other one on the right it remains intact and is turgid. So, that is the persistent synergid, the one on the left which is degenerating is called as the degenerating synergid and of course, you can see that the pollen tube is entering into the synergid which has already started uh, degenerating. Now, once the pollen tube enters into the synergid, it has to discharge its contents, especially the uh, two male gametes which it is carrying along with the vegetative nucleus. Okay. So, uh, after the pollen tube discharges its contents into the degenerating synergid, uh, the two male gametes, the vegetative nucleus along with the cytoplasm from the pollen, they can be now seen very much being present in the synergid two darkly staining bodies which are commonly referred to as the X bodies are also seen in this degenerating synergid. Now, Jensen in 1972 has interpreted these two darkly staining bodies as the degenerating nuclei, one of the vegetative cell and the other of the synergid itself. Okay. So, here uh, this is a, a picture which shows that uh, how pollen tube is received in the synergid, then there is discharged by the subterminal pore and the sperm nuclei migration for fertilization with egg cell and central cell. So, what do you understand now? Navishan was the one who gave the concept of double fertilization. He showed that both the male gametes are involved in fertilization. One fertilizes with the egg and second with the <coughs> excuse me polar nuclei. This act of two simultaneous fertilizations is called double fertilization. First gamete fertilizes the egg to form the zygote, it is called syngamy. The other fuses with the polar nuclei forming the primary endosperm nucleus, this is triple fertilization. 
So, uh, once this happens, one of the sperms comes in contact with the plasma membrane of the egg cell, the other comes in contact with the plasma membrane of the central cell. This is followed by dissolution of membranes and eventually transfer of sperm nuclei to egg nucleus and polar nuclei. Triple fusion usually takes lesser time compared to syngamy. Thank you very much.